This is Merchandise Mart. Transfer to Brown Line Trains at Merchandise Mart. Doors closing. Cool. Welcome to the Wise Up Weekly Wrap Up. Um, today is another wine and cheese. I got a special guest today. Go ahead, you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Adam Kamen. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, awesome showroom. Uh, looking yeah. forward to having dough someday to buy all this. Um, yeah. But I, <laughs> I currently have a two places right now. I'm a partner at a restaurant called the Delta in Wicker Park, 1745 West North Avenue. Um, and then I have a small retail, uh, organic, real wine shop is what we call it. Salud. Cool. So welcome to the Wisendell Weekly Wrap Up. We got another wine and cheese. For, I don't know which camera. We got two cameras now. Uh, at the uh, Scavolini Showroom here at the Merchandise Mart. Got a uh, great guest that fits with the wine and cheese uh, series. So go ahead. Introduce, introduce yourself. Yeah, Felix. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Adam Kamen. Um, I have a small uh, restaurant in Wicker Park called The Delta that I'm a partner with. Uh, Eldridge Williams in that venture and then I have a small organic natural wine shop and whiskey shop in Lincoln Park called Off Premise. Nice and how long how long have you had the shop for the wine shop? Uh, I bought it May 1st of 2017 we opened on July 3rd so July 3rd of this year will be two years for us. Nice. The shop's been there for about nine years uh, we just scooped it up and and made it really strange. Yeah <laughs> no it's funny when I was hanging out there that one night and then the other guy, other Adam came in, the previous the previous owner, yeah. yeah. And I was like, Adam, Adam, wait. So one Adam, and then another Adam bought it. So Adam, yeah, Adam bought it from Adam. That's, That's basically how it went. And then how long uh, how's the Delta been going? September tenth will be uh, three years for us at the Delta. So that guy's finally walking on its own. Um, so we're just looking to keep on keep on building, keep on doing fun stuff, cool stuff, yeah, uh, different stuff. Uh, offer unique experiences and uh, this podcast being one of them is an awesome showroom yeah right I'm so glad that <laughs> so glad to be here yeah um, I know you guys were active in the uh, the NBA all-star weekend you guys did a little event with um, uh, the mob rep group I think I'm not, I'm not too sure you guys supplied some food for that you know too, I, so. I believe so we have a yeah. we have a whole separate branch of the restaurant that uh, oh, really that does that yeah um, you know, my main focus is uh, booze. You mm-hmm. know, I, I know how to make money on booze, and I know how to get good booze, Hell and yeah. I know how to make people happy with booze, yeah. uh, which is much harder than you'd think uh, right. to make people happy with it. So um, what are we, what are we uh, drinking here? You know, I brought two uh, two wines today. Um, both of them are some really, really fun stuff. Uh, one is from the Illinois Sparkling Company, and this is a 100% Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Um, Chardonnay. Uh, so actually, so both the wines I brought, the uh, the berries or the grapes are uh, projects that were manufactured uh, through universities and the United States Agricultural uh, Division. Very cool. Um, so Chardonnay is a blend um, of Chardonnay with another French varietal, and it's mostly used... Uh, to make it a bit more hardy in cold weather climates, uh, hence the Illinois Sparkling Company is able to grow this in uh, right outside Chicago. And this particular one is a collaboration celebrating Nas's uh, release of Illmatic uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, and this is through uh, our buddies over at Petnat Posse, uh, yeah. who run a great uh, Instagram account. And um, so they're, they're, they, where do they make the wine? Like they make it here in Illinois. Here in Illinois. Yeah. So the 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 soil allows it to be like super acidic. So they started off trying to grow bulk grapes to sell, but because the soil is so acidic out there, or the grapes turn out to be so acidic, um, they're not too desirable. However, in Champagne, you know, you want some really high acid grapes. Um, And so these guys went ahead and and switched their business model. And now they're doing uh, basically method Champenois um, in Illinois. Uh, So right there, you'd be able to taste it and you can taste that acid on there. But it's all really rustic right here. You know, the disgorgement, which is getting rid of that yeast, is is done somewhat. A little bit of sugar added to it to re-sparkle it. Um, however, it's still a little hazy. You can see that it has this orange hue to it. Yeah. And that's kind of what we do over at Off Premise. We try to deal with interesting varietals, uh, interesting techniques. But so when when people make 
a run of this, how many cases or bottles are they producing? I want to say this is like a 500 case production. Uh, it's a private labeling for Pet Net Posse. Um, I'm sure I'll be here. Pet Net Posse. Uh, yeah, yeah, Pet Net Posse on Instagram. Uh, it's one of the better accounts out there. As I understand that he did it as a joke. Um, and then he started getting a lot of followers, and he was just showcasing pet nets, which is a uh, stands for Petulant Natural, which is basically ancestral method champagne, um, but made outside of champagne. So um, it's a unique type of sparkling wine, usually a little hazy, still has a lot of yeast inside there, rustic, um, but bubbly and you know delicious if you're looking for that effervescence. Uh, but he created this Instagram account to showcase all these pet nets, and then uh, he started you know, getting a lot of followers. So he had to keep on creating more content. Yeah. And, uh, it turns out it's grown into a uh, viable business. He runs a wine club out of my store and he travels all over just researching pet nets and acquiring nice. pet nets <laughs> is 500. Um, is that a lot or is that a million? no 500 cases is not a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the production that we have over the store is under 500 case production, but that it's also indicative of the, the farmers being the winemakers as well. So, you know, they could manage their small plot of soil and then bottle that up. So it's a very, uh, I mean, as low intervention as we try to be with the wines, it's a very hands-on approach, right? Like these farmers are very, very um, concentrated on their product, their agricultural mm -hmm. product. Yeah, which is nice to see because, you know, the only way to have real nice wine in the future is to really pay attention to how we're growing wine nowadays. Uh, so everything in the store is organic, if not biodynamic, um, and just how grapes should taste from the region where they're from. Yeah, that's interesting. You guys have the, the I guess, standard of, you said small, under... What was the case limit you guys had? Usually under 5,000 cases. 5,000, okay. You know, when we find guys like this, we want to support you know, yeah. 500 cases. But, you know, they're, they're quick runs. We could uh, unload them quickly Move out of the quickly. store. Yeah. yeah. A lot so of now do, you, do you tango those with the Delta as well? Or how does... The, the Delta is a very, very different program with uh, okay. with uh, wine. You know, I'm, honestly, I feel like I throw out more wine than I sell over Delta. It's all booze over there. Mm -hmm. uh, not even mm -hmm. so much beer. So uh, very whiskey mezcal tequila focused at delta and uh it didn't start out that way but that's what we become and yeah that's what i give the people and, and then the uh the last episode um we featured the uh widow jane well, yeah the widow so jane. talk a little bit more about that how did you find how so you uh that? widow jane is a company out of new york um but what they do is they source uh whiskey from uh, MGP, which is Midwestern Grain Production out of Indiana. Um, it's a big, massive uh, distillery that, you know, former MGP, or I'm sorry, uh, Seagram's plant. And uh, they make all this, uh, manufacture all this whiskey for people. And in the past, it used to be something frowned upon that these distilleries weren't making their own juice. Um, just so it turns out when this product turns around 12 years, it's delicious and everybody's looking for it. So what we do is we buy entire barrels of whiskey at off-premise, uh, what are known as single barrels. And basically the... Yeah, can you break that down a little yeah, bit? Yeah, basically whoever's in charge of the whiskey or the, the Rick House out there um, tastes through all these barrels. And there's certain barrels that exhibit some traits that are highly desirable. And these barrels are referred to as honey barrels. Uh, so... They pull these barrels out and they set them aside for private buyers like myself or stores to buy it. And then everything else gets dumped into the batch. Um, the single barrels, we taste through them. We find out which one we like. And then we buy the entire barrel and then it's bottled and labeled specifically for us. So what you were drinking on your last episode was uh, Widow Jane that was a collaboration between the Delta and Off-Premise. So we were serving it you know, by the glass or in cocktails at Delta, and then I was selling the bottles over at Off-Premise. Nice. And, and do distiller, uh, distilleries or... Do they have a certain time frame in their grow for people to come taste, or is it a constant thing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is it only, like, in spring people come and taste, or is there a picking time? You know, I mean, the, the fun thing about whiskey, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the fun thing about whiskey is, uh, is wood management. Okay. And it's, uh, some barrels are better than others. Um, they could be different grains of wood. They could be placed in different areas of the rickhouse, which is basically the warehouse where they're stored. Um, and you have guys that go through and taste them and uh, pull them whenever the barrel's ready. Uh, so they generally know that, okay, well, the left side and the sixth row is going to be, you know, better developed whiskey than the stuff down low. And uh, it really is a matter of tasting stuff because the whiskey may not be good now, but then in, in two months it may 
transform completely. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's very and interesting. And how do they? How do they like make a call, or do they? Would they invite you once they taste? You know, a, a lot. I'm just curious about that process. Yeah, a lot of it's, it depends on the brand, right? There's a there's a lot of brands that have a lot of stuff, and they don't mind giving it to anybody. And then there's a lot of brands that are very particular about who it goes to. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people want to see us do well, so we've done a Blom Brothers picks. Uh, that's out of Galena. Uh, we did our Widow Jane one. We did a total of 14 uh, private barrel picks last year. This year we're lined up for 30. So just yesterday I was at <laughs> Gibson's Italia. Uh, I was at Gibson's Steakhouse yesterday with Eddie Russell, who's the owner of Wild Turkey, and okay. he brought nine samples to Chicago, and we got to taste through them all. And is that the Italia on? Uh, uh, it ended up being Lake? Gibson Steak. Uh, so oh, also one at Rush. The one at Rush. Gotcha. Yeah. So oh. uh, hats off to Wild Turkey for sponsoring the entire thing. It was amazing. And uh, we certainly picked the best barrel, and that'll be bottled for us in a few months. I'll definitely bring one by for you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I know, uh, have you been to Gibson's Italia? Because a lot of people I, in the industry. I, I like that place there. a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so that's cool. So he brought how many, like, tastes did he He brought bring? nine samples. Okay. So these were. Uh, what's his name again? His name is Eddie Russell. Eddie Russell? Eddie is Russell. A character? Interesting dude. He's a, sure. he's a southern gentleman, and. <laughs> Um, if you ever have a chance to get down to Wild Turkey when you are in Kentucky, uh, the hospitality is uh, hands down some of the greatest you'll ever find out there. Yeah, uh, he comes up here every so often to you know promote his brand, but promote these single barrels. And uh, you know we're grateful that he had nine barrels and uh, he picked nine places he wanted them to go to. Yeah, and it's pretty flattering when Wild Turkey yeah, you know make sure that it, uh, I get a single barrel in a. Mm-hmm. 800 square foot store Dude, that's, you know? that's yeah, awesome. it, it really means a lot uh, for a small <coughs> for our small place yeah hands off hands uh, hats off for that um i've never been on the kentucky or bourbon trail have you, have, i'm assuming you've frequented or have you, you know it, been? I've, I've only been down there <laughs> once uh to louisville 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 <laughs> um and of all things i went down there to get my uh my introduction to sommelier so i actually went down there on a wine uh, journey and yeah. then uh, I, I hit a lot of bars. I hit a lot of whiskey bars. I was probably the worst student inside the wine uh, <laughs> class, um, but that was my only experience down there. So, so uh, have you followed the wine sommelier trail, or I don't know? If yeah, I, I, g- I gave up on it pretty early. Okay, um, just I, because uh, you just saw the like uh, the, the regiment, I guess. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I'm general, especially over at off premise. We generally are not really following what sommeliers are. Are serving and drinking uh, at restaurants. Like I said, we're trying to be a bit more unique. Um, a lot of these guys uh, want some variety, correct stuff, so that they can sell them at a restaurant. And we sell to sommeliers, basically, mm-hmm. but we're not sommeliers. Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, Peter, who I hired probably about a year and a half ago, we we stole him from Fifty Seventh Street Wines and. Franklin in the room and income tax. He was all over these cool places, um, but he seems to have his finger on the pulse of what the the cool kids are doing. Um, yeah. I, I I mainly focus on the whiskey these days, and then you know he gets mad at me because when I get excited about something, I'll go ahead and buy everything. Um, <laughs> but it really doesn't fit into his budget. But yeah, the uh, I had a gentleman uh, I used to work with. He loved Old Forester, the whiskey, and he would drink it all the time. And I never knew what it was and whatever he introduced me to it. And I don't even know if it's good or worth even mentioning. But I just thought it was interesting. That was really when I first found out, you know, the whiskey is like its own thing. You know, a lot of people follow that and, and dive deep into that stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's having its moment right now. Um, yeah. And I think that there's a lot that goes into it. But having a product that's uniquely American that we could all get behind and you know, are really proud of, uh, says something to the, the surge in, uh, interest. So I think it was largely inspired by mm-hmm. like the cocktail crowd and this, the, the advent of cocktails and how we're having all these cocktail bars going around. Yeah. Uh, it allowed more people to get into whiskey and yeah. then now people are, uh, are really nerding out about it. Yeah. Um, so you were, you said that you were, you're familiar with the merchant I smart. You used to do some wine and cheeses as well. What, what, like, can you just explain your story about how you got to where you are, your experiences? You know, I was working downtown um, in River North, and 
uh, one of these, and I, I can't recall the name of the place, but one of these little shops like this uh, asked me if I could do an event for them. And I think the, the premise of the event is they like to bring in interior designers to show off their wares that, you know, each shop here sells different stuff, yeah, different course. furniture. Um, and in order to do, do that was to uh, to wine and dine the people. And yeah. uh, you always, you're guaranteed a better turnout, I'm sure, uh, when there's booze and food involved. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my job was just to do yeah. whiskey classes or wine classes. Do you guys still do that at Off Premise, or do you guys have any programs? I, d- like I do a lot of classes over at Off Premise, too. Um, we've done some, like, bachelor party stuff or yeah. bachelorette party things. Um, but we mostly stick to free tastings on yeah. Friday. Yeah. Uh, we have a j- pretty good crowd of, for that. It's a lot of people coming in. That's the cool. barrier of entry is pretty low. You know, it's free. You can taste stuff. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard, you know, to, to buy a thirty dollar bottle, a fifty dollar bottle if you've never had it before, right? Like Yeah, absolutely. It's a absolutely. it's a gamble, it's a yeah. investment in some cases. So yeah. we try to offer that as much as possible. All the whiskeys we have open to try before you buy as well. Oh, um nice. so that could also turn into a yeah. a, a fun uh, a fun <laughs> uh, off the cuff event for some people. Yeah, for sure. Um I, I've been meaning to, to join the wine club. I haven't yet, but uh there, there's a lot of uh wine clubs to join and i know that you guys offer a, a tiered wine club and how do you guys come up with that program or what kind of program is that we're just trying to make it a, approachable for a lot of people and there's a you know a decent amount of people are trying to get into natural wines or organic wines and, uh-huh. and we're not specifically dogmatic on natural wines per se and and i could go into what that the definitions of that later Please, if you'd go, like yeah, go ahead man um, go ahead we got, we got some time yeah we actually it, didn't even set a timer be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I got nowhere to be. Okay. Yeah. Me yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just worried about your guests. No, I'm me a, neither. Or your, or your listeners, I should say. Right. You know? <laughs> um, you know, the, the definition for natural wine has not really been defined, but um, we call it real wine because our wine is made by real people coming from a real place. And basically, you start seeing the movement uh, is in response to this commercial farming that we saw happen a long time ago. And chemicals and and basically making safe wine right so and by safe i mean uh, non-offensive to the the customer so mm-hmm. you know all the cabernets at jewel generally taste the same because they're manufactured that way they they don't want you to try a cabernet that's you know different you know like if you're used to this this is what a cabernet is so we go the opposite direction and uh we try to showcase the uh, the soil and how the grape uh interacts with that soil so you know the cabernet from California from Napa is going to taste much different than Bordeaux or uh, mm-hmm. South Africa, or, you know, wherever, for example, wherever we're growing these things. But uh, the main thing is that uh, no intervention, right? So yeah. uh, no chemicals, uh, mostly or, uh, biodynamic or organically grown. Biodynamicism is a, uh, it's a trend. It's kind of a kooky uh, process about moon cycles and oh, really? uh, grinding Damn. up quartz and filling cow horns with it with bladders and burying it for <laughs> 30 days before you spray it on your grapes um, Getting crazy. It's, it, it's weird but you know and not that I believe in any of that at all uh, but no, I think no, that if no. people are doing that they're paying really close attention to their grapes and and that's what we're looking for we're looking for a qualitative product gotcha. Um, gotcha. So that that's uh, that's our main focus over there, and then minimal to no sulfates at the end. Um, and you know, some people have allergies toward them, aversions. Uh, but the argument is that some people say you know it's not a natural wine if you add sulfates to it. I'm uh, on the other side of the argument. I think that that prevents some bottle variation and can definitely stabilize a wine. Um, mm-hmm. But it's an argument that'll be going on and on forever. But yeah. I think the main thing to focus on is that you know no chemicals all 100% organic and you're yeah. le- you're letting the grape express itself right you're not supposed to manipulate these things like when we taste wine you know like this is wine from Illinois like I've, I I want to taste what that's like I don't want to taste wine from Illinois that's been made to taste like something else gotcha gotcha yeah I think Max tried uh, explaining that uh, no post flirtation oh wine. the Mar- Martha Stuman, yeah yeah for sure. so it's uh, um, it's a, it's an interesting movement um when, when do you think that that started kicking off or when do you think that you know the, the funny thing is is that years or it hasn't been going yeah, yeah we, we see we're seeing uh, an increase for sure um i mean the the funny thing is that this is how wine's always been made right so like in italy and spain these smaller farmers are like yeah so like that's how we've been doing it for hundreds right. of years right. um but i think that people have been really focused uh, on food right now and you know like organic produce and people are very concerned about what they're putting in their body from a food standpoint but then i think recently yeah maybe five ten years Mm -hmm. ago it clicked like 
oh wow we should probably be paying attention to the the alcohol we're putting in our yeah. bodies and then just people being more uh cognizant of sustainability uh the earth itself mother uh, earth exactly so paris has wine shops everywhere every corner uh natural wine shop every restaurant natural wine um new york got on not too long ago um there's a few out in california and chicago seems to be behind uh so that's technically that's why we went that direction with off-premise we're so close to Benny's and not yeah. so much foot traffic because we had to be different and yeah. uh i mean there's things i really believe in yeah. but we know that it's going to have its moment within these next few years here in chicago we could already see people ramping up and look into it um, yeah uh, did you already mention uh the address on the uh, 1128 West Armitage. West Armitage. Yeah, yeah, the name of the place is off premise. And then you, I, I think it's interesting that you definitely, I know you don't shy away from getting your hands behind the bar and chopping it up with the with the customers at the Delta. I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. How long have you How long have you been in the restaurant industry? Oh man, um, forever. I know. Yeah, we're looking at twenty years right now. I'd say. Um, <laughs> I, I cooked my way through college. I have a degree in philosophy, and then. Oh, uh, interesting. Once I got rejected from all my PhD programs, I uh, I quite literally just embraced alcohol. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we switched over. I was cooking for a long time and then started getting into wine, but it's like looking to hedge myself. Uh, by uh, c- cooking's a tough. Where'd you go to school? I went to DePaul. Okay. So Are you yeah. from Chicago? Or? No, I'm, I'm from a small village up north called Wonder Lake. Village. From a village of Wonder Lake, tw- twelve hundred people. Uh, you know, a lot of horses. Uh, a lot of stables, a lot of cows, a lot of corn. Really? Um, yeah, I was bussed into school. I was bussed into uh, Woodstock, Illinois, which is like a half hour away. That's where I went to high school. But then I, I came out here when I turned uh, 21 hmm. and uh, thought I knew how to cook, thought I was a big time chef and yeah. uh, really got beat up hard uh, yeah. in these kitchens and uh, cut my teeth with some of these yeah, man. The, hardcore uh, culinary guys. Yeah, they're, they're pretty hardcore. The uh, I remember in my when I was in the restaurant industry, I was messing around with one of the, the executive chefs who I was super close with. And uh, one of the sous chefs was like playing around with a knife and literally cut my forearm. I still have the scar. And I'm like, dude, like relax. Like, why are you cutting me? And it was, it was the culinary scene is super, super serious here for sure. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, back in the day, <laughs> it was, it was kind of hard to find a job. Right. And all yeah. these guys you're working for were coming out of charlie trotter so they were like some hardcore guys um Mm -hmm. the difficulty we have right now in the current state of uh uh cuisine and the culinary movement in chicago is you just can't find enough talent right like everybody everybody thinks that they're the best everybody will quit their job to go make 50 cents somewhere else and Mm -hmm. chicago just has so many restaurants and and which is great it makes our city awesome um we keep on creating more and turning over and reconcepting here and there but it's really hard to hold down staff that you know will stay at a place for a long time yeah, um, absolutely and you can see restaurants you know that are making it you know little to no turnover uh, so Delta we still have a lot of our original staff over there but you look at places like Purple Pig or you know of course I need the steakhouse is like they, they keep those guys for a long time because they're I mean, happy there the Delta from what I see it is more of like a community like the people who attend they're all like kind of on the same vibe Everybody just is there at a good time, talk to people, have drinks, have food. And, you know, it's interesting because I we went there for drinking a cocktail a few weeks ago. And then I ran into another friend who was there talking about that event. And they were like, oh, yeah, we're just having a few drinks, just collaborating and talking about what we're going to do. I'm like, that's awesome. Like, it's a it's definitely a welcoming place for sure. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're slowly becoming a little hub in Wicker Park, which... You know, I'm not sure how many people used to go to Wicker Park 15 years ago, but right. <laughs> it's kind of a, a shadow of what it used to be, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a pretty sterile environment right now, which is fine. You know, I'm, I, I love watching neighborhoods grow and change and become better, frankly. But, you know, we're, we're putting on a different vibe out there. Uh, yeah. We got up in the, onto North Avenue before a lot of people were out there. And uh, now you have Etta and Paradise Parks. So there's a lot of restaurants moving around us, but... Yeah, we try to keep it inexpensive. We want you to stick around and hang out. Um, you know, have some three dollar beers, have some two dollar shots. Yeah, you know, like uh, DJs are always good. Uh, yeah, we bring in bring in the talent. That's for sure. But yeah. that being said, like Thursday nights very who, different who than Friday night. Who DJs over at? Just in case there's any DJs listening. You know, uh, Chris Cap. Uh, you follow him on Instagram. He's okay. the booker, a promoter. Uh, takes care of all that for us. But we do have a bunch of friends of ours that. Uh, 
you know spin it up exactly yeah nice. some reco stuff or yeah. some open nights where we bring somebody in and we'll like them but uh yeah, yeah we always yeah. bring in some uh That's some awesome, fresh man. talent and just awesome trying to support that um Talk to me about this red. What do we got here? The, uh, oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. so we got some mead. and the uh, mead. Oh, man. Yeah, mead is a uh, wine made from uh, honey. This is technically a melamel, which is a uh, honey wine with fruit inside there. And then I... Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Damn, that's good. Mm. It's definitely, what is it, cranberries? Uh, Marion berry. Marion berry. So, the, yeah, that's another reason why I picked these two wines here. Um, Marion berry is also a berry that was created with the uh, United States Agriculture Department and the University of Oregon. Uh, so, basically, it's two uh, different types of blackberries that were mixed together um, to one, like bring better flavor, but know easier to grow uh, a bit more resilient to weather yeah and uh, can grow in different environments huh That's interesting so. where, where uh, do, you, do you follow like the food pairing and everything like that or, or no yeah yeah I mean yeah, I like, like what what would this marinberry go marinberry like? I mean <laughs> so yeah so we're drinking basically what a marinberry is is a blackberry so okay. we're, we're basically drinking a, a blackberry wine a honey wine um, and this is made by Ken Schramm is out of Ferndale, uh, which is right outside Detroit. Uh, yeah. And, uh, all this stuff is just packed with flavor. So when I'm now, how did you find that gentleman? Like how, do, how do you, how do you come across these people? I guess Ken Schramm was, so Ken Schramm's known like just his, your experience. his claim to fame is that he wrote the textbook I'm mead making for UC Davis, uh, which UC Davis is, uh. The, the number one enology school or wine school uh, in the entire United States. Uh, so people go that. there to learn how to make wine. People go really? there to learn how to run wine businesses. It's a huge agricultural school, but specifically focused on uh, vineyard management. Uh-huh. Uh, so he wrote the book, uh, the textbook out there. And then he's also the number one mead maker in the world. Literally wrote the textbook. Yeah, literally wrote the textbook, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ken Schramm. Um, but to answer your question, like he makes things with these big, rich, intense flavors, but... You know, I, I could see drinking this with some venison. Mm. Um, he has some other stuff with. Uh, it's a bit more astringent, but uh, at the at the meadery in Ferndale, they pair a lot of this with uh, bitter chocolate. Wow. Um, yeah, I could taste that. But I, uh, I just wanted to bring some unique stuff, some different stuff, um, but this intense flavors. Yeah, that's super intense for sure. Um, so, UC Davis school teaches you all about the wine industry in general or just everything yeah everything uh like farming, you mostly said. farming so yeah do, do they have i'm assuming they have a farm that they work with the oh yeah the they're all over i mean they're all over the state you know helping oh, okay. people out here and they have vineyards they send internship schools if you want to get a job pretty easy to do um but yeah agriculture right and, and grapes are finicky and they thrive in some environments better than others yeah I mean, and, uh, the only the only wine I know in Michigan is the cherries up in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they do that. Uh, <laughs> there's a Chateau Grand Traverse. Uh, there's a lot of Riesling grown in Michigan. Um, yeah. Same thing with uh, Finger Lakes, New York, and you're starting to see some of the big boys buying a lot of vineyards out there because, you know, we're still a few years off um, from the effects of global warming, but a lot of these uh, traditional wine regions are going to be devastated because of global warming and uh the ones that are going to have the perfect environment happen to be in uh, new york and michigan uh which is kind of wild to see how how drastic uh the yeah, climate can have on yeah. these uh vineyards that have been around for centuries in some cases uh, yeah. you know portugal is going to be decimated by it just because of the heat but new york you know properties being scooped up left and right by the people in the know hmm interesting um uh, that's a huge statement. I don't want to dive deep on that, but the Gens, uh, the Gensler, uh, the Riesling in Germany. Now, do our based on climate change, are things changing as far as the grapes that are being produced out of different areas? You know what I mean. Like if the climate is changing so drastically, are um, yeah, are the grape profiles changing with it? You know, the 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 flavor profiles from the grapes may not necessarily change, um, but your harvest dates are going to change. Uh, you know, like for example, if you want to maintain ultimate, you know, like the ultimate desired acidity, for example, in Alsace or 
Germany. Yeah. You know, you want uh, to pick these guys. They're, they're cold weather uh, uh, grapes that thrive in that environment, and they don't fully develop. Uh, and that's why you get the, such acid inside there. All the sugars aren't able to produce. But when you look at, like, really warm climates or hot climates, Napa, for example, that's why you get these big, huge, robust grapes with lots of sugar inside there. Now, when you see climate changing or it's going to be hotter in some areas, these grapes are going to have the ability to start producing a lot more sugars. And I think what we like about Riesling in Germany, for the most part, is that it's dry Riesling, right? Like, my mom loves sweet Riesling. I, I want it to be <laughs> bone dry, super acidic. But if the the world keeps on going the way it is, uh, which it doesn't seem like there's any stop in sight, no uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of uh, sugar rieslings coming out of uh, <laughs> out of Germany unless they start picking them earlier. But again, I, you know, I didn't go to UC Davis. Uh, this is I'm just I'm just going on when I'm talking to people way smarter than myself. Yeah, right, uh, I went but, to art school, so I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's funny. Um, so, I mean, just capitalizing on that. Oh, my God, getting crazy. For those of you who can't see, he's uh, pouring. He's mixing these two. Yeah. So what, what do we You know, I, I don't know. I've never done this before, but I'm, I'm pouring a little bit of mead inside. Are we the, disrespecting the uh, Pet Nat Posse? I, I mean, I no, don't I don't think so. I think they're probably going to start doing the same thing. Yeah. Basically, uh, Thank you. we're making uh, mead bellinis out of, uh, bellinis. Out of uh, Illinois Sparkling Company's I'm going to have to talk to the uh, Pet Net Posse and see if they want to come on. Oh, right? yeah. I'll put you in touch yeah, for oh, sure. Um, yeah, because that's interesting. I mean, they started something, and then it kind of took off. Where did they get the Illmatic? I, I think you said that. but That's, uh, that's in celebration of uh, Nas's uh, 25th anniversary of, of uh, the, the album, Illmatic. Of the Illmatic, yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, There's another podcast I watch where he references the uh, comment about uh, having the top down. And uh, for those of you who know Illmatic, there's another line that that I won't say on this one, but uh, it's about <laughs> titties and stuff. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting that they that they started this and then now it's running off. Um, what other cases do they have? Other things besides this one right now? You know, they have a lot of stuff uh, in the pipe for. Uh for the pet, the pet nap posse no quarter club which is their their wine club that they run through my store okay um i'm not sure what they have in the future for any more collaborations what's, what, what's the name of the wine club uh it's called the no quarter club no, so what's no quarter every quarter they get a uh, four wines that go out um mm. and again they're super nerdy hard to find pet nets or people coming up uh super small production um interesting yeah, I don't want to speak too much to it because yeah, uh, yeah. I know that Jared <laughs> uh, from Pet Net Posse, you know, he has his finger on the pulse just like Peter. So they're traveling all over. They're finding out where and how and who's making it and why people are making it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot more stuff is coming out of garages here in, uh, you know, the city or in California. It's a small now, time one. Is just as easy as someone making um, like their own beer? Yeah, I mean, it, it, so in some cases, it's actually easier, right? Because beer, you got to, you know, boil and mill the grain. Mm -hmm. And I'm not taking anything away from winemakers. Yeah, uh, right. But in, in essence, you're just crushing some grapes and adding some yeast. Um, in order to make it sparkle in the bottle, it's a uh, it's really this uh, bottle fermentation, which is secondary ferment or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, before disgorgement, which is getting all the yeast out of the bottle. These things are crown capped, uh, which is like the cap to a beer. And when you have it, uh, the yeast still fermenting inside the bottle, eating all those sugars, they're releasing CO2. So that's how you get sparkling wine. So huh. making making pet nat is a lot easier than making champagne. Um, uh, but you know you have to have this right materials. Uh, number one being the right bottles. You know, now like, why why do they say uh, champagne only comes from Champagne, France? Just because of the like the actual location? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an origin control, but a lot of this is... Uh, is you know, that strictly like a rights thing? It's 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 all negotiated through uh, trade agreements, uh, mo but mostly like the wine laws in France. So you can only make champagne in France because, you know, and it must come from a champagne. Uh, now, depending on the trade laws or trade agreements the United States has with these countries, <laughs> you know. Not, not, not to go down those. But right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, for the longest time, you know, like we were, we were seeing, we were buying uh, champagne made in California here in the United States, right? But that's because we didn't recognize the 
you know, the origin control that France had, or we didn't recognize that in the trade agreements. Uh, same thing is that like bourbon can only be made in the United States. Right? You can't. They can make whiskey everywhere else, but only bourbon can be made in the United States. And of course, it has certain technical uh, things behind it. Same with champagne. Only bourbon can be made in the United States. Bourbon can only no. Bourbon can only come from the United States. Bourbon can only come. Yeah, from bourbon the United can't be made anywhere outside of the United States. Really? Yes, sir. Huh. But so I guess that's the same thing as champagne. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Oh. Okay. So I mean, like legally to be classified as bourbon, you know, I'll just go f- through a few of them. But it, at least fifty-one percent corn uh, must spend some time in a barrel. Uh, it has a certain entry proof that it must go in at, and it must be made in the United States. Hmm. So now you could do all that somewhere else, but you still can't call it bourbon because it's not made in the United States. So is there like a uh, bourbon posse in Europe? That we don't know about. There, you know what? That's that, similar to uh, <laughs> that's I, the opposite. I, I'm sure. I'm, <laughs> you know, like I mean, people like whiskey. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, frankly, we make the best. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, just a quick fact check. What? When did when did prohibition? Uh, can can you answer that? Oh man, prohibition. I, <laughs> I don't I even know. Stop it. I don't even know. Sorry, Sorry it's about gotta that. be the 20s, right? <laughs> I think. I don't know. I honestly don't know. So yeah, I know. I know it was the Volstead I'll Act. Put it on the, is what, uh, I'll put it on the post. It was Truman, right? Not Truman. I'm sorry, Roosevelt. Roosevelt's, right? Ro- Roosevelt's the one that stopped it, and I think it was called the Volstead Act. But God. man, I think yeah. I'm gonna embarrass myself. Yeah, now no, for me, too. Like, me too. Me too. Asking um, all the tough questions. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I told you too that there's gonna be no <laughs> tough questions, <laughs> yeah. and then I hit I you with I mean, that. I, one. I shouldn't. I should know the answer to this. <laughs> and I hit you with that when the prohibition end. Um, well, cool, man. I just uh, want to give another shout out to uh, Scavolini um, Showroom and Ashley and her team. Um, anything else? Where where can uh, people follow you at? I know. Uh, you know, uh, our IG is off premise Chicago. Um, Instagram's a beast. Yeah, I mean, that's we make all our money on Instagram. Really, you know, for sure. You know, we just showcase what we have on there, and people come rushing in. You can buy stuff online too at offpremisechicago dot com. Um, we'll and make you guys sh- just post what you have, and then people are just mm-hmm. scooping them up. Exactly. I mean, we try to keep you know, unique stuff, right? Uh, I mean, as far as our beers go, it's all the hype stuff. Our wines, a lot of the hype stuff. I mean, I have collectible stuff that you can lay down for years, and you know, I mean, recently we sold a fifteen thousand dollar case of. Uh, DRC, you know, but we only get one of those, and that happens every so often. But we we, we try to have a little something for everybody. But our main focus is fifteen to twenty five dollar wines that you could crush tonight, right? Yeah. Like we have some low alcohol stuff, we have some high alcohol stuff. But basically, I just want everybody to keep on drinking. Um, and I want to get your opinion on this really quick before we sign off. Uh, when I was hanging out with you that one weekend, you I asked for a water, and you gave me the CBD infused water do you think cbd is like really making a run at at all of this or yeah I mean, how many cbd products have you kind of picked up I, I just sell uh the cbd sparkling water uh calorie free yeah. uh 25 milligrams of cbd uh it's having a moment um it's like free cash uh it's all snake oil i don't think it works at all but what what is snake oil snake oil remember the those guys in the streets back in the day that Maybe. would sell snake oil and <laughs> no. you know and as as medicine uh-uh. you know uh-uh. but it doesn't it doesn't work <laughs> you know but you know i don't yeah, know so if they're having a moment as well yeah I'm, I'm not sure if there's a cbd lobby out there that's going to come after me for this but have you been to a store yet i haven't i, I have not. not either no you know like I I, i'd rather spend my money on on the Actual, real stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. Actual I, uh, flower. But uh, but hey, people people swear by it. Uh, a lot of dog owners, you know. I, I used to carry the CBD dog snacks, and uh, these people uh, with elderly dogs, they feed through dogs, and I think it's just a uh, a peace of mind. Um, yeah, that it makes people feel better about giving them the dog. Yeah, you know, right. I'll drink one once in a while if I'm thirsty and I don't have any other water. But yeah, for three dollars for a sparkling water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. And it's okay. So you mentioned off premise, and then um, the Delta, the Delta Chicago. Or? Del- yep, uh, the Delta Chicago for sure. Um, we serve food till one a.m. every single night. Uh, DJs on Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday. Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday. Interesting. Why? Why Tuesday? Is that just the interest? The industry night? Yeah, we. I mean, Mondays are industry night. You know, if you work in restaurants, you get half off your bill. Let's uh-huh. go ahead and mention it. Um, but Tuesday we try to do, you know, showcase this particular brand, 
um, and they bring the DJs in. So, for example, you come in on a Tuesday and you might have a gin company buying all the cocktails for you that night, or the you know. But we'll have we just want people to try new stuff um, on Tuesdays. And, and Tuesdays, and and music is definitely a way to get people in. Yeah, you know, oh, these yeah. these brands love it because then they could get these new brands in front of you, uh, which is frankly that's how you build a brand is you just got to throw money at it. Yeah, at least in the booze business, I'm not yeah. sure about these, <laughs> you know, these, these, the these, these chairs. You know? Yeah, they're very, they're very nice chairs for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but Such a oh, and for those of you watching visually, um, Ashley did have other chairs here. We actually changed these chairs, so these aren't the actual chairs that go here. We are sitting a little high, so just wanted to clarify that for everybody that's watching uh, visually. But uh, Adam, dude. Thank you, man. Hope yeah. uh, I, I know you talked a lot. You had a lot of a lot of talking. So I, hope, I, I, uh, I ramble. Hope everything was okay. But uh, cheers, man. Thank cheers, you, man. Uh, Thanks for having it, me. For Appreciate sure. it. Bye, guys. Thank you. Your safety is important. If you observe unattended packages, vandalism, or suspicious activity, inform CTA personnel immediately.